Chapter Eight of the Stillwater Tragedy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Stillwater Tragedy by Thomas Bailey Aldrich. Chapter Eight. The six months which followed Richard's installment in the office at Slocum's Yard were so crowded with novel experience that he scarcely noted their flight. The room at the Durgins, as will presently appear, turned out an unfortunate arrangement, but everything else had prospered. Richard proved an efficient aid to Mr. Sims who quietly shifted the payroll to the younger man's shoulders. This was a very complicated account to keep, involving, as it did, a separate record of each employee's time and special work. An ancient bookkeeper parts lightly with such trifles when he has a capable assistant. It also fell to Richard's lot to pay the hands on Saturdays. William Durgin blinked his surprise on the first occasion, as he filed in with the others and saw Richard posted at the desk, with the payroll in his hand and the pile of greenbacks lying in front of him. "'I suppose you'll be the proprietor next,' remarked Durgin that evening at the supper-table. "'When I am, Will,' answered Richard cheerily, "'you will be on the road to foreman of the finishing shop.' "'Thank you,' said Durgin, not too graciously. It grated on him to play the part of foreman, even in imagination, with Dick Shackford as proprietor. Durgin could not disconnect his friend from that seedy, half-crestfallen figure to whom, a few months earlier, he had given elementary instruction on the Marble Workers' Association. Richard did not find his old schoolmate so companionable as memory and anticipation had painted him. The two young men moved on different levels. Richard's sea life, now that he had got a sufficient distance from it, was a perspective full of pleasant color. He had a taste for reading, a thirst to know things, and his world was not wholly shut in by the stillwater horizon. It was still a pitifully narrow world, but wide compared with Durgin's, which extended no appreciable distance in any direction from the Stillwater Hotel. He spent his evenings chiefly there, returning home late at night, and often in so noisy a mood as to disturb Richard, who slept in an adjoining apartment. This was an annoyance, and it was an annoyance to have Mrs. Durgin coming to him with complaints of William. Other matters irritated Richard. He had contrived to replenish his wardrobe, and the sunburn was disappearing from his hands, which the nature of his occupation left soft and unscarred. Durgin was disposed at times to be sarcastic on these changes, but always stopped short of actual offence, for he remembered that Shackford, when a boy, amiable and patient as he was, had had a tiger's temper at bottom. Durgin had seen it roused once or twice, and even received a chance sweep of the paw. Richard liked Durgin's rough wit, as little as Durgin relished Richard's good-natured bluntness. It was a mistake, that trying to pick up the drop thread of old acquaintance. As soon as the permanency of his position was assured, and his means warranted the step, Richard transported himself and his effects to a comfortable chamber in the same house with Mr. Pinkham, the schoolmaster, the perpetual falsetto of whose flute was positively soothing, after four months of William Durgin's bass. Mr. Pinkham, having but one lung, and that defective, played on the flute. "'You see what you have done, William,' remarked Mrs. Durgin plaintively, "'with your ways. There goes the quietest young man in Stillwater, and four dollars a week.' "'There goes a swell, you'd better say. He was always a proud beggar. Nobody was ever good enough for him.' "'You shouldn't say that, William. I could cry to lose him and his cheerfulness out of the house.' And Mrs. Durgin began to whimper. "'Wait till he's out of luck again, and he'll come back to us fast enough. That's when his kind remembers their friends. Blast him! He can't even take a drop of beer with a chum at the tavern.' "'And right, too. There's beer enough taken at the tavern without him.' "'If you mean me, mother, I'll get drunk to-night.' "'No, no,' cried Mrs. Durgin pleadingly. "'I didn't mean you, William, but Peter's and that set.' "'I thought you couldn't mean me,' said William, thrusting his hands into the pockets of his monkey-jacket and sauntering off in the direction of the Stillwater Hotel, where there was a choice company gathered, it being Saturday night, and the monthly meeting of the Union. Mr. Slocum had wasted no time in organizing a shop for his experiment in ornamental carving. Five or six men, who had worked elsewhere at this branch, were turned over to the new department, with Stevens as foreman and Richard as designer. Very shortly, Richard had as much as he could do to furnish the patterns required. These consisted mostly of scrolls, wreaths, and mortuary dove-wings for headstones. Fortunately for Richard, he had no genius, but plenty of a kind of talent just abreast with Mr. Slocum's purpose. As the carvers became interested in their work, 
they began to show Richard the respect and good will which at first had been withheld, for they had not quite liked being under the supervision of one who had not served at the trade. His youth had also told against him, but Richard's pleasant, off-hand manner quickly won them. He had come in contact with rough men on shipboard, he had studied their ways, and he knew that with all their roughness there is no class so sensitive. This insight was of great service to him. Stevens, who had perhaps been the least disposed to accept Richard, was soon his warm ally. "'See what a smooth fist the lad has,' he said one day, holding up a new drawing to the shop. "'A man with a wreath of them acorns on his head, Stone, ought to be perfectly happy, damn him!' It was, however, an anchor with a broken chain pendant, a design for a monument to the late Captain Septimius Salter, who had parted his cable at sea, which settled Richard's status with Stevens. "'Boys, that Shackford is what I call born genii. After all, is not the one-eyed man who is king among the blind the most fortunate of monarchs? Your little talent in a provincial village looms a great deal taller than your mighty genius in a city. Richard Shackford, working for Roland Slocum at Stillwater, was happier than Michelangelo in Rome with Pope Julius II at his back. And Richard was the better paid, too. One day he picked up a useful hint from a celebrated sculptor, who had come to the village in search of marble for the base of a soldier's monument. Richard was laboriously copying a spray of fern, the delicacy of which eluded his pencil. The sculptor stood a moment, silently observing him. "'Why do you spend an hour doing only passably well when you could do perfectly in ten minutes?' "'I suppose it is because I am stupid, sir,' said Richard." no stupid man ever suspected himself of being anything but clever you can draw capitally but nature beats you out and out at designing ferns just ask her to make you a facsimile in plaster and see how handily she will lend herself to the job of course you must help her a little oh i am not above giving nature a lift said richard modestly lay a cloth on your table place the fern on the cloth and pour a thin paste of plaster of paris over the leaf do that gently so as not to disarrange the spray when the plaster is set there's your mould remove the leaf oil the matrix and pour in fresh plaster when that is set cut away the mould carefully and there's your spray of fern as graceful and perfect as if nature had done it all by herself you get the very texture of the leaf by this process after that richard made casts instead of drawings for the carvers and fancied he was doing a new thing until he visited some marble works in the great city. At this period, whatever change subsequently took place in his feeling, Richard was desirous of establishing friendly relations with his cousin. The young fellow's sense of kinship was singularly strong, and it was only after several repulses at the door of the Shackford house and on the street that he relinquished the hope of placating the sour old man. At times Richard was moved almost to pity him, every day mr shackford seemed to grow shabbier and more spectral he was a grotesque figure now in his napless hat and broken-down stock the metal buttonholes on his ancient waistcoat had worn their way through the satin coverings leaving here and there a sparse fringe around the edges and somehow suggesting little bald heads looking at him you felt that the inner man was as threadbare and dilapidated as his outside but in his lonely old age he asked for no human sympathy or companionship and in fact stood in no need of either with one devouring passion he set the world at defiance he loved his gold the metal itself the weight and color and touch of it in his bedroom on the ground floor mr shackford kept a small iron clamped box filled to the lid with bright yellow coins often at the dead of night with door bolted and curtained down he would spread out the glittering pieces on the table and bend over them with an amorous glow in his faded eyes. These were his blonde mistresses. He took a fearful joy in listening to their rustling, muffled laughter as he drew them towards him with eager hands. If at that instant a blind chanced to slam, or a footfall to echo in the lonely court, then the withered old sultan would hurry his slaves back into their iron-bound seraglio and extinguish the light. It would have been a wasted tenderness to pity him. He was very happy in his own way, that Lemuel Shackford. End of chapter 8